All right, so welcome everyone. Um, this is the um, first of what we'll hope we'll do more uh, sessions like this, which is try to have an interactive panel that's responsive to excellent, interesting events happening on campus. So this week, as some of you would know, maybe all, um, UCI, we're hosting the first, hopefully maybe more than, maybe annual um, eSports collegiate, collegiate eSports conference. And what we have here is a panel of uh, guests, colleagues, uh, speakers from the conference who've, who've kindly agreed to come and talk a little bit about the work they were working on, some maybe themes that they saw happening in the conference, um, giving us a chance to interact around the ideas that were happening at the conference. So I know some of you got over there. I see some faces I've seen the last couple of days. Um, many did not. So hopefully this will be a way to give you some window into what the key themes and issues are, and then to get a generative discussion going among us in the room about what are some of the key issues moving forward. So I'll just do a quick and dirty needs analysis here, and before I do an intro to what the conference is, how many people here are, say, um, relatively, who would identify as relatively familiar with eSports? Okay, so is that like half of me? Okay. Uh, how many people are like su super interested or, or follow eSports relatively closely? How many people here like really don't know much of anything about it at all? Okay, good, that's right. All right so there's maybe a little more than that. Okay, perfect. So, um, all right, so as you may know, I will give the quick kind of primer on where things are, roughly speaking, and then um, we'll turn it over to the panel. So, esports, from my last panel, I heard usefully defined as generally digital video games, because the E, I guess, that have a competitive structure, so they're skill based, there are winners and losers some way of ranking people on some sort of ladder. And then what distinguishes that, why there are now eSports, are really two other phenomena. Uh, our last um, are some audience spectatorship, so there are people who watch these things, and at least a sizable group to be counted. And then second is um, some form of monetary so it could be essentially the fact that you've got professional, professional athletes, well, not quotes, pe professional people who do this for a living, and then industries operating around it. Now, there are um, a lot of boundary cases. There are things like Sean will be talking about, um, maybe never heard, that, that is, does not currently have prize money, but as we were talking. But like that also bucks, is skill based. Yeah. It does. Oh, sorry, it does. Like it's skill based bucks, yeah. and, has a, and has many of the same features. So, so we treat these as family, as a um, as uh, prototypical definitions, not as things that you have to look at very closely, you know what I'm saying? So, although there is the temptation to engage in long debates about what's an eSport and not, we're trying to avoid that and just say, look, these are definitions by family resemblance. Those are the key features that would typify a typical eSport. So, as you also may know, uh, UCI is one of the leaders in this. Uh, our team, our coll collegiate team is very good. Uh, we are probably the best program, maybe. So we won the League of Legends National Championship. We were second in Overwatch. Uh, we, have, we were one of the first programs to have scholarship athletes. So we have paid scholarship athletes on campus. Um, and we have you know, the arena, which is right at the student center. And in general, I th we're at least on the forefront, if not, we're one of the leading, if not the leading programs in this. So what we decided to do, by we I mean Constance, <laughs> largely, um, got together with Mark Deppi, who runs the program, to launch a conference to start uh, talking about the issues around esports and college campuses. There are a bunch, just some things I will throw out there. So one is just research on esports. So people like the panelists who are doing everything from developing metrics of teamwork and how teams function and learn, all the way over to historical and critical analysis, um, and then everything in between. So you have academic research. You have second, people like us who've oftentimes been uh, handed or put in roles where helping guide, advise, or influence esports programs. So as I mentioned, we have the esports program here on campus. Constance does this. Other people have done it in the past. But serving on boards to helping them develop things like policies around scholarships and should athletes get preferential treatment to get into classes or the admissions policies. Um, how should we be dealing with issues around equity and gender representation and equity when scholarships come in? There are a lot of really interesting, thorny issues the more you start um, digging into this. Um, and then also, just, then just things like curriculum. So that there it was emerging going to be a, a teaching SIG for those who have, have to, who, who, 
delightful responsibility of teaching courses on esports. I don't know what goes into one, what, what should be included and not. So things like that. So really all of these different areas were represented. Something that we tried to do, and I think relatively successfully, is try to have it be partially an academic conference, partly kind of academic support staff. So if you would be someone who's running or thinking of leading a club or an organization, this is a conference you can go to for learning tips, tricks, whatever. Uh, and then third, a place to interface and, and talk with industry. So we had a, um, we had a keynote from Twitch, uh, which is an important platform for streaming esports. Um, there was supposed to be actually a Blizzard keynote. They bailed like three weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, which created kind of a uh, running around trying to find some replacements. Uh, but so trying to get conversations so that if we are talking about issues like the quality of chat in a Twitch stream next to a match, that we have someone there who could <coughs> hear these complaints and then possibly do something about it, rather than just have be a siloed academics talking in and among ourselves, where we you know decide, well, we won't solve problems, but <laughs> we describe problems, maybe solve them, but then they can't leave the room. So one of the ideas really was to have this breakdown silos, but have conversations in and among these constituencies. There is a peer review track. We were able to get, I believe it was 35% um, the acceptance rate for papers. So there is a traditional academic structure going along with it and inside of it, but then there, there are also other events. And I think the other last thing I'll say is we really tried to have it be a celebration of esports. So there were Hearthstone matches. There was a, um, there was a legal, at least one League of Legends match. Um, there was the giving of the ceremony where they uh, gave out the rings for the national championships. Um, there was a cosplay event. So there were a lot of a lot of events happening around it, which if we continue, I suspect there will be more. I want to say, is anyone up on the, the $100,000 prize thing that that was all about? Does anyone, Katie, do you know anything about that? There was, a hundred, I believe, a $100,000 prize event that the sponsorship that InVent had for some sort of competition around it. Um, I don't know all the details, Constance would, but that was one of the more interesting, kind of behind the scenes thing, one of the more interesting things of how do you hold an event <coughs> like that, help the sponsors get what they want, but then also remain and keep academic integrity. And there are a lot of issues around that that, that um, she's juggling all of the time. Right? So, um, so anyway, that's kind of a background intro to the event. Um, what I was thinking we could do is do just a quick go around the panelists, introducing themselves, talking a little bit about what they were working on or presenting, and then uh, opening the floor for questions, uh, maybe talking about a couple of the key themes that came up. Yeah. So, so as somebody who was really surprised by the scale of esports development, in the audience who don't know what the real scale is, what's actually happening in terms of production in San Francisco? Yeah. Um, uh, unless I, does anyone have those off the top of their head? I, I can. Well, I, I, so um, it's one yeah. of those big sort of blue sky opportunities as, as a sense of the scale, I'll go to the money figures because that's what everyone always goes to. So, well, the Fortnite just announced a $100 million prize, which is a fairly large prize pool, <laughs> which, you know, Fortnite launched in G uh, February, January, March. So it, for a game that's like six months old, just and it is probably a $2 billion property, um, just announced this $100 million prize pool. The, the way that the, tr the, the more athletic, or the, sorry, the more competitive prize, so the economic structures of that side of the industry are, you have leagues that exist like traditional sports where they have seasons and teams and players are salaried employees and those are driven largely by sponsorship. Uh, during the keynote, the, close, or the last night's keynote, I heard a figure which was, many of the, the, economic, numbers, many of the economic numbers are not public, but there was a publicized $50 million sponsorship deal between Twitch, is it Twitch? Um, and the Overwatch League. And it's believed that that's at least 100 million. And, and of that, I think the salaried pool of salaries, the average e uh, Overwatch player's salary is around 70 to $90,000 a year for like the average. Um, and that's not the largest league. There are others that know more. You, you, you more. You know more of the financial projected numbers. for all of esports for this year is 950 million. Okay, and the thought is that that could be, that might who knows that could I mean because the growth curve is like this that could be 50, it could be 100 billion, it could be you know, who knows or, or not. Or, or just not. Um, so I, I mean does that give you some of the sense? Um, there there are a bunch of things that are interesting, but one of them is that 
how you, and this actually came out of our last panels, it's tricky to know how you even count that, right? So if, if something like Overwatch or League of Legends, where you have this professional league of people who are getting paid by advertisers, or in the case of Dota, it's actually community donations. There's a community that puts up money for a prize purse in the case of Dota. But you have that, but then you also you have all the downstream sort of revenue sources and so on. So how you count it really depends on how you choose to slice it up. In the case of like Overwatch, well, does how much does the existence of that league then push sales down the line? So you, you can decide where you want to how you want to cover these figures. But yeah, so a billion you said? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good number to cover. Viewership numbers for like world championships would be the seven you took there. So it's like uh, NBA, MBL, and NHL, I think, combined. finals combined. So the, you know, so the, Na the National Basketball Association, Hockey League, and Baseball, if you combine all of those and you get the finals for the League of Legends. It's a global viewership, which is a, a really big, important deal for the one year viewership. I mean, the other thing I'll say maybe for just people in the room that have no idea, sort of half of what Kirk talked about. So, like, cities have professional teams. LA has a professional esports team. New York has a professional team. There are tournaments held in giant coliseums, little players down on the floor, giant projection screens, hundreds of thousands of people in the arena watching the players play live. So when we talk about that, and then also player, people around the world are watching these events streamed. Um, and countries have their, you know, within countries they have multiple teams, and some of them are corporate, corporate sponsored, some are city sponsored, you know, those kinds of things. So it's like the NBA or the NHL or that kind of thing. That's yes. super yeah. helpful, thank you. Yeah. This is the part of the metaphor that breaks down for me, yeah. is the, who's the NFL? Like, who's the NBA? Because if some of the teams are private and some are public, Oh, well, they're all, they're all private. There's no public. That was my idea. Well, I mean, like, yeah. public is public, partly publicly funded is where I was going to go later. But I just yeah. mean, like, the league structure. Is well, so there isn't. This is what's understand. interesting. So it's a wild west at the moment. There isn't an overarching NHL, NFL commission. So it's been a bottom-up growth, often driven by... Like, Blizzard uh, owns the yeah. Overwatch League because Blizzard right. owns the game. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. so there, and so this is what the, there's a lot of open questions now about sort of where this is going to go because it's the Wild West, and people are trying to figure out how do you maintain kind of integrity with the amount of money that's flowing around. How do you protect young people? That's more sort of my question. Young people, because now kids are aspiring right to be these esports players, but they're not really protections because it's teams are owned and operated in different ways, leagues are all owned and operated in different ways based on the game. So it's a, it's a time where all of this is trying to be figured out around the policy impl implications of, yeah, the, the regulation implicate, you know, all of, all of those kinds of things. Are there other questions of that sort that's helpful for, don't know, don't know, we don't know. If you're, if you're have a device or if you're multitask, it's worth looking at what the size of these championship events, they're, they're pretty awesome. I mean, they're, they literally are filling stadiums with 50, 60,000 people watching on giant screens. Um, yeah. Do you know like the demographics of these viewerships or, yeah? Um, you, I'm gonna look over to you. I don't, a lot of it is heavily uh, male in between, you know, 14 to 25 but that also depends a lot on game and on platform. A lot of the console communities are a lot more diverse than the PC communities, for example. And it's also heavily regional. Yeah, so even absolutely. within a specific game, um, if you're playing it in Southeast Asia versus playing it in North America, there'll be a completely different culture that emerges around that. Yeah, so like, I mean, a lot of times people will talk about esports as if it's this monolithic, Kind of entity, but it's it exists in all of these pockets all over the world in very very different configuration and in configurations, and money is flowing in really different ways. So it's kind of hard to like say this is what this is, um, but there is something happening, and the scale keeps getting larger and larger. Like the business incentive to change up the game, so 
So players that are not esports players or competitive players will still have more fun and still have more engagement because everything's changing all the time versus having a solid underlying role structure for how to actually compete in the competition versus the game. I'm happy to go. Okay. It's a great question. I taught the multiplayer game design class, so I had to talk. Yeah. <laughs> I had to prepare a lecture on this. Um, in general, it is seen as a way of refreshing the game so that you can bring new people in. It allows you for games that have levels. It allows for a season dynamic. So every, they call them seasons. So that every season they can refresh content, update things, potentially sell more things related to that season in the case of something like Fortnite. Or oftentimes it's a season pass. And with that pass, you will get X number of things. Um, it also potentially keeps the game fresh so that you will see a new variety of strategies and things emerge, and it's a way for them to deal, as designers, with design flaws or updates. So it's arguably, it kind of, it's arguably a good confluence for designers between their own selfish <coughs> business interests and then friendliness to newbies and then keeping the content fresh in some way. Um, but you do see, from a design perspective, you will see certain kinds of games uh, or, or games adopt certain features because it's more <coughs> friendly, like adding heroes. You can add new heroes, which you can sell content on. So I don't know if that answers it. But it's, it's definitely a thing. And But it, uh, one of the other questions, which I guess we're all saying, it's worth maybe reiterating, is the fact that the company owns the game and owns the game rules is this giant unavoidable problem or thing that can be wrestled with. Which I can actually kind of speak to in a sure. very odd and odd Oddball way. Are, are we sort of off the plan, by the way, of, of introducing ourselves? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> as you talk, I can, tell, I can tell you who I am. Yeah, do that. Okay, hi, I'm Sean. Um, Sean Duncan. I'm uh, Assistant Professor General Faculty in the Media Studies Department at uh, Univers University of Virginia. Um, I'm the one person on this panel who probably does the least with esports. Uh, as Kurt mentioned early on, this the conference um, was cast as one where competition, tournament structure, play, learning were all sort of intermingled, and the, the work that I presented on was about a card game called Android Netrunner. Has anybody ever seen Android Netrunner? Uh, there's some, some vigorously nodding heads out there, and there's always like three, and no more than three. <laughs> <laughs> Android Netrunner is a card game that has had a fan-structured um, uh, tournament structure or, around this. Um, it's, it's, got a, it's had a, uh, um, it's, we're talking a very small game. There's a, only a couple thousand people who really play around the world, very little in terms of of, um, of financial rewards, and it's a game that is now potentially due to lagging sales, but also due to the fight between a couple of different corporate owners for it, ending in, a, in 10 days from now. Um, and what you mentioned about, about the ownership of the game, uh, what I'm studying and what I'm looking at right now is the moment in which the fans are taking over a game like this and trying to develop um, new forms of organized play, new forms of tournament play, new forms of incentives and prizes, and new game design. Um, as it goes along. Um, so I, I find it really interesting that when we talk about things like esports, we're often sort of assuming a corporate ownership, we're assuming a, a, a profitability, we're assuming, we're, we're looking at the gaming systems that are frankly the, 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 the real big ones in the room. And I think that's natural and understandable to do. So what I'm trying to do is shine a light on these other niche areas because those are also the moments, uh, these kinds of games and the moments that this game is in right now are also the ones in which we get to see a lot more player agency and we get to see what happens when players take over a game and see how they self-organize and see how they, they uh, think about what their entire mission is. If they're not consumers, what are they? And what are they going to try to do with a game like this in the future? Excellent. Let's actually go down the list and we'll do introductions and then we'll go back around. Sure. How long? How short? Uh, a minute or two. Okay. So, hi guys. I. Uh, I'm Andreas Liebold. I'm uh, an assistant professor at the Danish School of Education, so I decided to come halfway around the planet to be here. Um, <laughs> the reason for that is that Denmark is a pretty small country. We're situated in Northern Europe. We're about the size of Minnesota, population-wise. Um, and not, and we are, we do have one of the first Kent universities dedicated to IT and computer science in the world, the IT University in Copenhagen. Um, but we, don't, we aren't not many researchers dedicated to games and gaming. And as one of those people, I'm, I have a psychology background, slight like neuroscience background, so I find my phone ringing every week with journalists or um, somebody with a good business idea or students or someone who wants to know about esports, gamification, 
um, art game spat for kids, this kind of stuff. So for me, um, the reason why I'm here uh, <coughs> and have been for the past 10 days is really that I feel that there's a big need to kind of consolidate our understanding of what is esports, what kind of research is going on and should be going on both in the US because a lot of stuff is going on here but also internationally and how can we each chip in as people coming from different disciplinary backgrounds. So what, what I have been looking into recently has mainly been the reasons that different um, high schools in Denmark have had to start up esports programs. They, uh, the first one cropped up in 2016, that was a sports college. We have kind of an overlap between what you'd call high school and first years of college. And they were a sports college, just, they just wanted esports as another sport on their program. And then it's kind of been expanding a couple more in 17, and now there are eight, 13 high schools in that small country who have esports programs. And what's interesting to me, both as an educational psychologist and someone interested in how schools and games interface in general, is what are their modes of doing games within a school context or doing competitive games within a school context? How do those integrate with the organization of the school day, the school work? Who are, who's going to be the coaches? In some cases, it's faculty, faculty. In some cases, it's pro gamers who are just trying to make a living off their skills. And some of them are terrible coaches. They should be led nowhere near classrooms. But they're still there because no one else is kind of stepping up to the plate right now. So that's kind of the, the space that I'm interested in working within as a psychologist and why I've been like really had my mind blown by listening to these very much smarter than me people. <laughs> Maggie Sekulnasi, I'm an associate professor at Northeastern University uh, in the computer, and science, uh, com computer information science as well as in College of Arts and Computer Science. I'm kind of joined between different departments. Uh, I'm very interested in understanding the user experience, uh, specifically within the game context. And a lot of my work have been looking into how do you use data and visualization techniques to understand what people are doing and maybe even to use them as a reflective. Uh, tools for, for people to learn more about what they are doing and to learn their strategy. In the context of esports, we have been looking into uh, Dota and, uh, and League of Legends and, and, uh, and data from, from these games. And as we discussed, like the games are changing all the time, and so you can't just feed it into a machine learning algorithm and think you're going to get something out of it. And so we are really interested in looking at how, con uh, how contextual issues can be, uh, uh, can be inputted into uh, something that machine learning could use and visualization could use so that you can put like, the human in the loop in the process of understanding what's going on in a game and the user experience of that. Uh, so I'm Katie Salen. I'm a professor here in informatics. I teach in the um, computer game science program and also the Masters of Human-Computer Interaction. So I have a background in game design, but I've been doing work in games and learning for a long time. And I sort of fell into the esports thing, not because I'm really enraptured <laughs> with esports, <laughs> but because it's um, I'm interested in supporting young people in pursuing their interests and sort of getting better at things. And there are a lot of young people that have um, interest in gaming. They have gamer identities that I would love to help legitimize and diversify that um, legitimization of identity for a lot of kids. Um, and there was an opportunity to help launch a high school esports league in Orange County, which is now a sort of national effort. Um, and my role on that project has been leading um, the design of a coaching program where we recruit um, college level esports players that have a prof professional standing. Um, they've competed professionally in some way. Um, and they, they work with young people. They coach these high, school, high schoolers um, within this league and really looking at it as a workforce development opportunity for those college students, many who aspire to become professional coaches, um, as well as supporting young people that are interested in participating in an esports club or an esports league and sort of pursuing that interest in whatever ways make sense uh, for them. My first encounter with esports actually was I think like in 1993. I was in Singapore doing some consulting with the government there around like how to make their students more creative. Um, and I walked into the Net World Championship event <laughs> that just happened to be in Singapore, and it blew my mind. I actually did not know this existed. It was in a giant arena, and it was just thousands of people just like, ah, you know, so excited, multiple games being played. And I just, I felt like, oh, there's something very interesting here. So a couple years ago, I did some work with um, uh, Yang Ming Kao, who was a PhD student here. We studied the StarCraft II community. Um, he studied it from an HDI perspective to understand like how does 
how are kids kind of learning in this game? Um, and I studied it from a game design perspective to understand, well, how does one, what are the design decisions one makes when designing a game for eSports? <coughs> StarCraft was one of the first that was intentionally designed as an eSport. Um, and to me, that's very interesting. Like, how does one design this particular kind of competitive structure? So I find it really interesting with, with lots of like problems that I also find very interesting. <laughs> Um, so I'm Stephanie Bullock, and I'm an associate professor at UC Davis, where I uh, teach games, make games, and play games there. And I think, um, so, so I come at eSports because a lot of my interest in, get in video games hasn't necessarily been like the video games themselves, but what the people do with games, around the games, and the whole kind of cultures of play. Um, and uh, I actually wrote a book recently that has this really, really long title called Metagaming, Playing, Competing, Spectating, Treating, Cheating, Trading, Making, and Breaking Video Games. I actually have to read it because I can never remember. <laughs> um, and again, like the focus, and that's how I sort of came to um, eSports was because people, and not necessarily the companies, were doing these incredible things with games. So a lot of people here have mentioned Dota 2, right? There is no Dota 1. This is a game that was made as a mod in like the Cambrian soup of the Warcraft <laughs> 3 editor and then kind of rumbled towards this form and there's a whole kind of complex history that I won't go into until this company named Valve, uh, that are very wealthy, uh, decided to kind of take up what these players had done and then essentially not make a game but make a sport out of it. In other words, build the infrastructure for this to be a competitive <coughs> game. And so I think recently the things that I've gotten interested in is actually like when people talk about esports, they often start by giving the like the money stats, right? Or like how yeah. many eyes are on this, or how much money is flowing through the system. And the, the the work that I've been doing recently is actually less on those sort of top down forms and more on the kind of experiments with money that are starting to circulate through all these systems. So like esports gambling is huge. Um, depending on how you look at it, even arguably like bigger than traditional sports betting. But people aren't betting with real money. They're, met, they're betting with a token asset called a Counter-Strike gun skin that it then can sort of, through various means, be like turned into real money. And so there's all of these kind of incredible experiments that are kind of coming through players interacting with all these systems. And I'm really, really interested in that. Awesome. Um, yeah, if I put, uh, one of the things I think it's fascinating about games and uh, one of the things that drew me to them is that you, if you are <clears throat> interested in questions more broadly, irrespective of games, but just about how people interact with, use, remake technology, examples like that are just some of the most interesting and compelling about how people take up, remake, shift, design things, <coughs> different institutions come in and, and codify them, people then either take them up, resist, do whatever. It's this, uh, the mangle of appropriation, I guess, is utterly, completely fascinating. Um, yeah, we'll do a question, and then we will go, I uh, have a couple within this. <coughs> there was mention of uh, striking out evil from the creative sports as well. Um, I was just curious what you guys think about the pragmatics of becoming a professional. Uh, is it something you would recommend your kids do? age is around, you know, sort of college age, 20 to 28. Um, you do age out a bit at some Fast. point. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, because there's, you know, there's some, like, twitch physical skills connected. So one thing about esports is that the, as many sports, so this is always my question, like, what's so special about esports? It's like a sport. There's infrastructure in that. We <coughs> look in other places very similar. So there are players, but there are also shoutcasters, which are basically the broadcasters. There are media producers, web developers, marketers, fans. There's like lot. There's a whole ecosystem of ways in which one participates in esports um, and can be hired within that ecology. I met a woman from Red Bull yesterday that runs the performance team, <coughs> right? 
So there are actually a lot of places for someone to go that's interested in esports. So the, the player channel, I think, is probably very similar to player channels in most professional sports. It's like not, it's going to be the rare young person that makes it there. Um, but again, there are many, many ways to participate in it. And because the um, esports is very much from the beginning a kind of spectator sport, that again, there's lots of young people learn how to participate in lots of ways much earlier, maybe, than in some other sports like football or hockey or volleyball or that kind of thing. I don't know if other people have anything to add to that. Yeah, I saw a talk this morning, Emma Likowski um, from Australia was presenting some information on esports players in Australia. And again, this. Uh, Somebody I forget who had mentioned that the, you know there are obviously regional differences in this, but um, it just struck me as, as shocking that you know the median age of an esports player in her data was around 21 and a half or something like that, um, and then the median age of a coach was like 22 or 23. <laughs> right? So that I mean, that upends so many assumptions we have about what coaches do or what the path through a game and a retirement of a game is like and what their paths are after that. We're talking about people who are still college-aged, roughly, and are about a year older than, than the other players. And yeah. that was really surprising to me. Actually, yeah, I was sitting on, in a, no, one of the panel was also on, they were talking about, like, a person looked like a college student, yeah. and then he's like, yeah, I'm retired, and now I'm a coach. I'm uh. like, what? <laughs> and there are several people, actually, in the audience that were also coaches that were retired players. Does anyone know that age span? So when, if you start early, then usually when do you end? As a pro? Well, it's, it's mid, to, from what I understand, mid 20s. 26, 27, yeah. I think. Yeah. Typically. Yeah. Just, I mean, to, to answer your, your question kind of more directly <coughs> about like uh, this as a viable sort of career path. So, you know, for every Steph Curry, for every Dendi in Dota 2, for Henry Dupree in Counter Strike, right? <coughs> for every millionaire within whatever kind of sport is being done. There's an ocean of exploited and unremunerated labor on which the system is required to like operate. So that is something that I think gets inherited from a lot of the infrastructures of pro sports, and I think that it's a real issue within uh, esports in kind of the same way, right? So you get these young people <coughs> who are retiring who have been doing this thing all their lives, right? Like you're putting in uh, anywhere from three to fourteen hours a day playing this game, right? And then you retire and what do you do, right? So like in Korea, for example, this is a problem that um, like organizations like PESPA, I don't know what they're doing, but they're trying to think, they're like acknowledging that it's an issue, right? That you have, like how do you deal with this generation that like haven't gone through a lot of traditional schooling routes or have taken these paths and so, you know, what do they do post Esports, really, you know, their esports career, if they even had one in the first place, and that's not to mention the other forms of kind of extractive capitalism that's going on, not just with the players, but with the shoutcasters, with the cosmetic item designers, with the whole kind of circuit that many of these companies are, are you know, using. Yeah, and, and that's we, we were talking about this yesterday, Katie. That one thing that concerns me a little bit about how this is emerging really quickly, and it's not really to get panicky about it, it's just to point to some of the issues that are now starting, starting with kind of kids getting the ambition of becoming, of going pro, and different companies, different operators from the college level to the high school level to the private level, kind of offering that dream to them in, in various guises, either as consumers or as participants of, of different kinds. Um, one of the things that we see in some of the high schools in Denmark, some of the environments there, is that they say, yes, we will train you to be a pro. You will be able to make money off this. This is our goal for you. And you'll get a high school education, but that's kind of an added bonus. Whereas what I see you guys doing here, kind of the, the model that's developing at, uh, from, from the UCI uh, context, seems very powerful to me. And that's what I'm going to bring home to Denmark to say, OK, so it's pretty cool that you can do um, esports gaming based activities and even create curricula and do courses that involve this. But if you can build a community around that and say, but there are a bunch of other um, roles to take on in that space. And even when you're not playing, you can be the caster, or you can be the director of merchandise for your team, or you can be the, the one who, who writes the battle reports, or what, uh, what have you, to try to make to present as many different careers within that space that might segue into other careers as well. Seems to be like a, a fairly um, 
reasonable way of going about not killing that dream, but still not uh, enabling it in a, in a non-productive way as educators. Andre, were you working with the CASPA thing? Um, Constance and I met the CASPA folks, and e echoing what you said, they have serious concerns about what to do with the players who sort of retire or, or, or don't want to retire but are no longer good enough. Um, and so part of what we're actually talking about is, is setting up a UCI partnership with them where they come here to do continuing education um, and actually become coaches <laughs> for our students, right? Yeah. Um, so something along those lines where, where they need to be brought back into but not completely give up what they're doing. Reintegration. Yeah. Um, <laughs> could we talk a little bit about the coaching thing? Because I think the coaching thing, I'm going to laugh. Part of me does find it kind of funny. I don't think it's, I think I can laugh. It's just how <laughs> odd the coaching situation is. I mean, I don't want to laugh at like someone's misfortune, but um, can we talk a little bit about some of the things people have seen um, around coaching this age? Um, just what are some of the dynamics of coaching? Well, so here, part of what I'm thinking of was the, um, we've also been talking to the trainer, the trainer for, and psychologist of the Los Angeles Valiant. So this is a professional Overwatch team in Los Angeles that has hired a trainer who worked for the Boston Red Sox, and he's a UCI grad, actually, and for the NFL, and he's been brought in to help increase their um, uh, to help generally support the organization. And one of the, a couple of the first things he said, by the way, that's kind of interesting, was that getting the players to get a good night's sleep and exercise is the, yeah. the most obvious thing. Yeah. Like, here's the thing, get out and move around. And then second, he was working with coaches, and he'd said that you'd think I was talking about very high-end level coaching, but it really was. When you have a 22 or 23-year-old player who has come up playing and his only real professional experience is as a game player, helping them become better coaches is literally, some of them just don't insult your teammates, you know, <laughs> don't just yell at them, which I guess in, in professional sports, I guess there's a model of that, there's the old grumpy coach, but he said it was really some really basic things that they were learning, but it's just of, curious, is another, there any? Another thing I think I have heard uh, one of the coaches was saying he was struggling a lot with the understanding how to manage a team. Because as a player, you know exactly you can you have the expertise and you can maybe deliver some of that expertise. But there is a lot more to it to how to manage a whole team and, and figure out how to uh, tune back dynamics of issues that maybe can come up in the team. So that was kind of an interesting thing. Maybe yeah. Uh, yeah, the maturity of the coaching. Or Katie, some of the social emotional learning stuff around coaching. Is there any? Well, yeah. So the. The coaching that we do for this high school week, um, the we recruit <coughs> coaches that have the technical skills, but they're hired because of their social intelligence. So we interview them around their ability to actually support young people in developing skills around communicating with their team, their teammates, mm -hmm. conflict resolution. How do you actually uh, develop goals for yourself and reflect on them? How do you you know those kinds of things? So and it's interesting the coaches that we hired come from I think. 14 or 15 different states, so they're all over the country. Um, I, like more than half are social science majors. <laughs> I thought we thought it would skew towards STEM, but there are more than half are social science majors. Um, and so, some of the coaches that we hired um, actually have worked with professional teams, but they're like have degree. They um, also are yoga <laughs> yoga coaches and wellness. <laughs> Because that's actually, I mean, when you look at professional coaches, they're not always the people that were the best players professionally, but they are people that know how to connect people. They, they are people that know how to motivate, understand why why people are struggling, what can help them kind of get better. Um, people that really work with team dynamics, with community and that kind of thing. So the coaches we hired, that's what we were looking for. Folks that could work with young people in a way around the community capacity and the kind of character building um, you know, piece of things. I mean, one thing I did hear, this is just slightly connected at the conference over and over again, is that one reason people like esports, they like to play it, they like to watch it, is that they feel like they're part of the community. It's a social piece. Um, and that, that's a piece I don't want to lose sight of. It's, it, is, it actually gives people a purpose, a shared interest for them to kind of rally around together. Um, and appreciate that and celebrate that in a lot of, you know, a lot of different ways. So that's one thing we kept hearing from people who are like, 
Oh, the, the players themselves love the fact that they get to hang out with each other offline. Like that's the most important thing for them. <laughs> as well as like the, ki the kid, the youth um, programs that we heard about, all of them were like, oh yeah, we had our little tournament, but then we realized we had to create like a non-competitive space at our tournament for anyone to come to just hang out and game with each other. And that's the thing that brought, brought kids in. Um, so that community piece, I think, is with lots of kind of interest that the community develops around it because of the social bonds that people develop around a shared pursuit of a shared interest. All right, other questions? Oh, uh, oh, oh here, you, you had your back. Um, I think my question was touched on in little bits as the conversation has been going on, but um, you asked, you mentioned the money in the beginning, <clears throat> and you talked about the popularity of esports, and but you also asked who was familiar with them. And esports aren't really my thing. I'm actually, I'm, I'm more interested in a compelling single player experience. Mm -hmm. But as we've seen, for example, with the upcoming release of Fallout 76, even stalwart single player franchises now mm -hmm. are starting to incorporate what can clearly be seen as the elements of full on esports games. And so I'm wondering what you feel the impact of the success, especially when you're saying Fortnite reached its success levels after only six months. And they have lower development costs, they have, they tend to have um, much faster return on those investments. And are we gonna start to see even, or are we gonna start to see fewer and fewer uh, single player experiences as we move, as companies want to move towards the benefits of having games that either are esports or are original franchises that are now rebranded as esports or something like that. It reminds me a lot of the growth of online gaming 2002 or three, where everything <coughs> like, I remember like Deus Ex maybe or two, and they're like, oh, we have an online mode, and all these yeah. resources went to that. The shoehorn network. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I suspect that the good news is that maybe some of the hype will go away, and then the people who really want to work on crafting good single player experience still will be doing so. But I don't know. What do you think? Well, I mean, I I I don't know this, but I I've, I've heard that there are a number of games that are now trying to incorporate battle royale modes as yeah. sort of additional. The, 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 these are essentially being shoehorned in, but not as central experiences, but as either DLC or as some extra mode that is that is coming with with um, some of these games. I don't know if Fallout seventy six is going to have that or not, but um, I believe like the new Red Dead Redemption game. Oh, is it? Uh, that's what I, I, I think. So I'm not I'm not certain on that. So I mean, I, I game design is faddish, as 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 any other art form is, and in some ways, I think people are going to try to capitalize on that. That's a very different thing than what Katie was talking about earlier, is designing an eSport from scratch. And I think that distinction is worth thinking about. Like appropriating a, a, a system that is in a popular eSport will presumably happen quite a bit as a way to supplement or augment some kind of single player experience. Um, but I'm not certain that's, I mean, the, the development cycle for designing an eSport is extremely different. Mm -hmm. um, people who are more familiar with that than me might be able to comment on that. I mean, this is probably common knowledge to a lot of people, but it used to be that we thought of designing a game as you'll build a game, you'll put it on a cartridge, it'll be sell in a box, and then that'll be your your window to make money off this. Maybe, maybe it's an arcade machine as well. And we've been moving steadily towards a model where it's more of a service design process. And, um, so most game companies now are not making their money off selling a game. They're making the money off all the different streams of revenue that come at the tail of that. So selling season passes, um, even Android Network, the card game is actually an expandable card game. So you'd get a huge box with lots of spaces for new cards and then you'd buy more cards as this progressed. So it's even gotten into kind of the s sacred grove of, of board games <laughs> now, which which I kind of don't like too much. But uh, so, so, so we, we, we definitely need to kind of reevaluate the notion of what being a game consumer is or how to monetize games because there are so many other things going on now that are definitely moving beyond that pure, beautiful single-player experience, which incidentally I think is also where, where I'm at aesthetically. Yes, but I, I, I don't it. think it will completely make an, this, uh, that uh, a single-player experience kind of disappear. Uh, because you, if you look at, for example, a company like EA, most of the revenue of EA will come from sports, like uh, the FIFA game is making most of the money, right? But they still make a lot of other types of games. Uh, I don't think that would disappear but it might create a revenue stream for a company to be able to make other titles that they are passionate about doing but they couldn't do because of the revenue issues. And, and I mean, oh, sorry. It's not a zero-sum game. Right. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> games are weirder now than they've ever been and stranger. And I don't even, like, I don't play AAA games. I don't need the games that companies are making. Because I think that there's far more interesting sites of aesthetic production going on. So, you know, I think that the, the kind of rise of one mode for however long it lasts isn't going to be to the, to the detriment of, of other experiences that are out there. And I'd also like to raise the, the, the sort of obvious historical point here too, which is that single player games are a genre that has existed for what, a couple of decades? Right, the long history, this is, this is a card game guy talking here, right? The, the long history of games is are, are, one, are, are games in which they've been played competitively, in some cases somewhat collaboratively in team-based spaces. Sports are actually the longer historical framing for these things than um, what we consider the digital video game. And I think that's an important thing to consider when we're talking about the ways this is changing the, the digital video game landscape. Others? There was a few. Yes. I apologize if I don't articulate this as well. I'm really interested in esports and regarding like how they reproduce societal expectations and norms, and there's been a lot of good work on how esports reproduce like toxic masculinity, gender norms, meritocracy, these types of things. But in terms of like class, esports already seems like something that is relatively expensive to get into because you have to have a high level like gaming rig to play certain games that require like you know microsecond inter like interactions. Um, is there a sense that the community is skewed towards specific classes, and how does that compare to you know traditional sports where um, you know they're kind of universal across right. um, social classes? That's a fantastic question. question. So, like the Smash community, for example, flourished because GameCubes are cheap, yeah. right? And then why did like esports in China take off? It's because of the console ban in China and the fact that like. The like PC gaming was the dominant mode that um, that you know young players had access to, and so it's like um, it, it's it's one of those things again where it's regional and it's game specific, and there definitely are those like the, the there's those games that are, that demand that kind of classically expensive rig, and I think that that's what like the esports industry right like the 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 kind of big money ones are trying to promote, right? Like you need the gunners, you need the, the screen, you need the, the mouse pad that's like this big if you're gonna, if you're gonna play properly, right? Um, but actually they, they don't, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a far more complex narrative and actually there are sites of deep poverty and also sites uh, where the, and sites of exploitation along with um, uh, the, the first part of your, your question like toxic masculinity, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, I mean, you, it is absolutely part of the culture. Um, it's, it's very hard to get away from. And, and you know, that, that's in extremely important to try to actively work to change if you're interested in producing any sort of culture of gender and racial inclusivity. Yeah, the other piece I'll add, so there are, and this was present at the conference, to a lot of initiatives and efforts, which I'm part of around engaging young people in this sort of interest, and how, how do you validate that, support them. Um, we know that the data in the after-school enrichment space is showing the gap getting bigger and bigger and bigger between poor kids and kids that have come from well-resourced families. Mm -hmm. Um, and so a lot of these efforts right now are either very grassrootsy, so they're just at the school level, schools trying to just make it happen for their kids, or through efforts that I'm part of where it's philanthropic funded. But they're not, neither of those are sustainable. Um, so to sort of change the equation around that piece of it in the after school space, it's gonna require companies in a way to start to care, kind of care about that as a space that they might wanna support long term. So we know the data in the after school for kids, it's like, hugely problematic. So if you begin to say, oh, after school isn't a space of intervention to help close that gap, you, you have to deal with it at a kind of economic level. Also with the kind of class issue, um, I'm also very interested in kind of media literacy in general, kind of parental involvement in game stuff like that. And we're, and generally the studies that are coming out of in that space now are finding that kind of parental involvement, kind of what you call co-viewing in the TVH. So we all know that for a kid to really get a lot out of a TV program, the best way is usually to watch it with them and reflect about what, what's on it there. And middle class parents, 
even though they don't have much time, are definitely the ones that have the highest level of engagement and literacy in that space. So there's definitely, one, on one hand, kind of an economic class issue, but there is also just kind of a parenting style, parenting engagement thing that's very interesting. And I haven't seen much stuff done on that in the space of gaming, but I'm sure it's out there and it seems really important to me. Let's get another, was there one we had? Another question? <coughs> Did you have one? Sorry. I can't tell. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I'm pointing, looking that way. You? Yeah. Did you have a question? No. You? <laughs> you. You got a hand, clearly. How does the coaching differ from professional sports? So, like, if, if you're the manager of a major league baseball team, you are putting together a lineup, and you are <laughs> dictating a lot of how your team plays. You know, like, it's not just up to the players. Like, you know, if you're, you just, if you hop on a game of Overwatch with a couple of friends, you know, there's no one sitting over saying, like, okay, you're going to do this role, you're going to do this, 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 and planning out the strategy and giving you lineups. And so I'm kind of interested to see how the coaching differs in that sense, where in a lot of major league sports, it's the coach is not only trying to, like, support his, his or her players and try to, you know, come around them, but they're also oftentimes, like, the figurehead and telling, like, you, you're, if your coach is telling you to do something, you do something. I, I grew up playing baseball and soccer, and that was very typical of how it was. Like, you, your coach tells you you're going to play right wing. Well, you don't like playing where it sucks to suck. If you want to play, you, you go play, you know. So. Yeah, so, so there's an absolute parallel. I think it different, probably coaching styles differ, but it's the same idea. But also with esports, as with many franchises, it's actually like the general manager that's calling the shots. Right. Um, so um, in terms of, like, drafting for their team, who do they pick? You know, there's there's all of those particular issues. The coach probably has some say in that, but it probably is a franchise um, issue. But it's very similar. That's that's the role of the coach. So for me, that's some of the interesting questions. I mean, I wasn't around at the sort of birth of games and game design and games and learning is like a field, as many people here were. And there's a similar thing happening now. It's like, oh, what is this thing? Is it a field? Is it unique? Is it different? What's unusual about it? What can we learn and draw from other kind of other kinds of fields? So there's lots of parallels with other um, competitive kinds of structures, whether it's like even competitive chess, right? You can look at that as a, a similar kind of thing. The difference, some differences around esports, at least from a research perspective, is because it's digital, the opportunities with the data are very powerful. Um, it's hard to study like a, a non-digital competitive sport often because it's just like how do you track sort of what's happening. So there, I think there's some really interesting research opportunities just because of the fact that it's digital, the, st the streaming platforms, the, even although a lot of it is proprietary, you don't have access to, but it's just what struck me again from the conference is that the folks looking at esports are coming from every discipline, mm -hmm. every methodology. Um, and that's really exciting to say, wow, there's all of these different eyes on a, a in a way, a phenomenon, a, con, a set yeah. of contexts, multiple practices with lots of questions and wonderings. And so that, that I think is really exciting to be part of yeah. like the, the incredible diversity of folks that are just trying to make sense of sort of what's happening. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I, I totally agree. And also just on the, the kind of, you know, uh, traditional sports versus esports kind of thing. Um, I think there's this really sort of interesting, in terms of public perceptions, not in terms of what these things kind of are at a philosophical level, if you think about like money ballification or <laughs> like the fact that there's all these new digital technologies of actually tracking sports, right? So we're in this moment where like sports are increasingly starting to look like a video game and video games are increasingly starting to look like these sports where we're really concerned about the players' bodies and all of the, the sort of embodied kinetic activity that is involved in the, the thing. So it's like there's this coming together that's, that's happening that's really um, interesting. Yeah, one of the, um, the last night's keynote was Chris Cluey, the former Minnesota Vikings punter who also was in a, a World of Warcraft rating guild, like a high level rating guild, and he was one of the important uh, voices Standing, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, stand, resisting Gamergate, whatever you want to call it, pushing back against the Gamer Gators. Um, and um, he drew a lot of interesting parallels, and is someone who I think will continue because literally pro athlete and reasonably good esports, and is, and is an advocate for various teams. One of the things I think I think you see seeing is that it looks, in some ways, it like it operates a little bit like maybe the modern NBA, where players 
choose their teams or there's like a dating they kind of choose each other the the there's a role in some games like a shot caller if people have seen this where there's someone on some teams who will call the shots like now we're gonna go right. or i think which it reminds me a little bit like a point guard or maybe a quarterback who's literally changing plays but that is done like in consultation with the cult coach so it would be interesting to see also as that sport one of the interesting things he had mentioned by the way was interesting his big things were players need to unionize you're getting ripped off on your contract, which I don't know if people saw that the argument with yeah. the Blizzard lady. It was like, dude, you're getting ripped off on your contract with Blizzard. <laughs> and um, so it'll be interesting to see as pe- people like him decide to try to, you know, what lessons can be learned from the last hundred years of labor and sports. But back to the point, it'd be interesting to see if these things change in parallel because you also do see that the, the physical sports relationships continue to change as players are more empowered. I mean, the other thing that's happened in traditional sports, and this is parallel to what you're talking about, is because they have become so, so much about spectatorship mm-hmm. that they're changing the rules of the game to make it more yeah. palatable on television. Like, I played volleyball in college, and the year I graduated, they suddenly changed half the rules because they wanted to speed up the games for television. Huh. And I was just like, what? This is a game? <laughs> like, so you're seeing that, too. Well. It's yeah. like, yeah, the, it's the, so interesting. It's beca- yeah. like the rules. So it's not just video games that the rules change. Like, the modern sports games, are, the rules are changing all the time. And, it's, oh, yeah. and, and, and lots of it is being driven from the kind of entertainment perspective, yeah. consumption perspective. And, and to your point about, about coaching as well, I mean, Major League Baseball has been through a lot of changes in coaching the last couple of years and the emphasis of what the coach actually what the manager actually does on the field versus this is just echoing what people were saying before but um, versus what the general manager has done and what decisions come down from the from the front office Um, one thing I do want to come back to though is that ridiculously small age gap between the player and the the coach I think if there's there's that's actually seems salient to me having learned about this yesterday uh, <laughs> but it seems but it seems salient to me in the sense like if there are any sort of residual paternalistic ways of, of, of dealing with players which you were hinting at earlier right the, the coach tells you what to do um, when you no longer have a generational gap between the coach and the player how do players actually manage that? Do, do you have more distributed models of, of coaching, like what Kurt was talking about with, with shot callers? Um, I, I don't know, but I find that to be a really, really fascinating place. And also, I hate to say this too, it depends as well, because the game matters, and the kind of structure of the game matters. Esports are not monolithic, right? So playing a League of Legends is extraordinarily different from, are, are there even coaches for Hearthstone? I, I don't know, like, but that is considered an esport, right? There are there's a, a range of different kinds of ways of coaching. I would imagine um, that that arise dependent upon the mechanics and the systems of those games. So, so it's getting close to time. To, it's basically time to wrap up. Um, I want to offer everyone a chance to one sort of either question or future direction or thing that hasn't been brought up that you would like to just call the room's attention to. And I've got one if no one else does. I've got one that I heard this morning, I'm the guy with all the stuff I just heard about. Um, but um, Nick Taylor from NC State had a really provocative talk about the ways that, that all these things are changing, not just how um, we view sports, but how, how we view sports and how we view esports, but um, a, a different framing for how we are audiences in general. Um, and really thinking about the, the kinds of work that go into um, being a participant in these communities and being a, a spectator of these communities is starting to look more like we're doing, and Stephanie might have things to say about this, but the, the kinds of labor that get pushed off not just from the, from the, the companies into the players, but also into the, the observers of these games. So I'm talking about shoutcasting, but also all the other kinds of activities that happen around that. And that was really exciting and provocative for me to hear because um, this isn't just about uh, esports. This is about sports. This is about watching. The other thing that I, I think um, uh, worries me a lot when, because I do a lot of work with gay and with data, and now that everything is being reported, and now you also have Twitch, and you have you have a lot of data, and what's the ethical implication of that, right? So there's uh, there's always that issues that uh, I think needs to be brought up and, and discussed. So my uh, one thing that I didn't see much at our conference, but I, I think we'll see more of this, that I'm getting interested in kind of the societal discourses and interests around esports, because when I, whenever I get in a, in a lift here, they say, so what's a conference? And, and we say esports, and they go, what? And we say gaming. Oh, gotcha. Um, so I'm getting really interested in how the notion of esports kind of 
uh, changes the landscape of views on gaming in general, but also kind of what parents need to know about the gaming, because those are the questions I get all the time. How can I, as a parent, get involved with this? Where should I send my kid if I want them to have good role models? What, what are the kind of issues of toxicity online that, is, that I should be aware of? So that, that kind of space is something that I, I feel we could do, do more in. Stephanie, did you have a student doing the thing on the Korean Air Force? Oh, yeah. That was cool. <laughs> that was going to be my thing. Do you, do you know about that? <laughs> like what, what, like what, that whole kind of story and the evolution of the Korean Air Force team? Oh, the, uh, so, oh, wait, maybe, I, I don't know if Sam was talking about that, but that a little bit about that where um, StarCraft is uh, a game that was made by an American company called Blizzard. This one is mine, by the way, so go ahead. Yeah. And, um, okay, and, and um, it has, it's, you know, there's the GOM TV, there are television shows in, or television, television stations in Korea where that's all that is, is broadcast. It's a very popular eSport there. Um, was it the boxer story where, oh. so they have mandatory military service yes. and because one of the more famous eSports players there, uh, boxer, yeah. uh, he had to go do his mandatory military service and so they made a team within the military. Yeah, within the Air um, Force, the official Korean Air Force team. Yeah. Kind of like we have in the United States, Navy's football yeah. team or Army, yeah. yeah. But it, it's, it's very interesting because um, a lot of these players who are coming out of pro-Korean StarCraft so when they, they sign on, they don't just sign on to be part of a team, but they literally live in these, um, you know, like StarCraft houses, right? Where they're to like dorms, um, where all these teams, they live together, they, um, you know, like their, their food is made and then they, they train, right? And then they go from there into mandatory um, military <laughs> training. <laughs> so it's, that's why there's this issue that I think uh, some of the folks were talking about this weekend. But what's interesting about this, though, um, is that there's like a longer historical framework for this, where this isn't just this like the rise of StarCraft. It's that you know, if you look at the history of Go, this was one of the um, kind of the equivalent of the the quadrivium or the trivium in Western education. Uh, Go was one of the uh, main elements of education in in um, you know early Chinese uh, forms of schooling. I'm, I'm not an expert in this. And so there were these go houses that kind of became, in a weird way, like an interesting precursor model for um, some of these StarCraft houses. So is there a tradition of people uh, living together and studying and a strategy and playing a game really hard? Yeah, that, that's been going on for a lot longer than you know the, the, the kind of emergence of eSports. And so that's what some of the folks on that panel that was my, this is interesting talk I saw yesterday, whatever, that blew my <laughs> mind. I mean, thinking, what? What's going on? So anyway, yeah. thank you. Hopefully I'm sort of summarizing yes. that. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. for me it was also interesting though, then there's this extra layer context of Korea's support for this sport and industry as a part of their efforts to build an entertainment economic industry. And these yeah. are and a group of economic warriors, they started calling them, who are going to go out and kind of spread Korean culture and uh, yeah, to there the are ways this also intersects with the history of Japanese imperialism yeah. and American imperialism yeah. uh, that uh, that um, that this, the speaker was was yeah. talking about in some really really interesting ways. Really fascinating. Katie, you have that shot. No. Of and so do you. <laughs> that was, I didn't mean to take yours. You can take yours. Uh, let's count that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you, um, Andre. Do you have anything to do? I mean, else we're wrapping up. You have any announcements or things? Uh, save your questions for downstairs. You have six great people to ask lots more questions. Okay, so come join us for a social hour. Thank you. Thank you.